and um, depending on how it goes here, we, we might actually finish up chapter 20 tonight. I know it's been about 11 or 12 weeks. Actually, it's sometime in July, but uh, hopefully we'll finish it up tonight. Um, verse 17 of chapter 20, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You know, and if, if we are to look at the, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, and look at the pattern of the Ten Commandments, one of the things that we would observe is that the first Ten Commandments, as they are written, deal with outward actions, behaviors, or sins that reflect the inward condition of the heart. So in other words, the command is dealing with a specific sin, a specific behavior, but as we look into them, we see that these actions, these sins, are a result of what is going on inside the person. The tenth command, however, deals with the inward condition of the heart that results in all manner of evil. Now, what does it mean to covet? Um, the definition of it here in, in, uh, from the Hebrew is uh, to desire, delight in, uh, beauty, delight, desire, lust, precious, or longing. You know, and, and I, you know, if any of you guys have seen like uh, the Lord of the Rings, you, you guys remember Gollum? You know, precious! You know, I mean, that, yeah, it's kind of like that, you know, about the ring. So that's, that's the idea behind covetousness. That's a great example of covetousness. It means to desire wrongfully, inordinately, or without due regard for the rights of others. And we're going to see some examples of that very thing tonight. You know, we're told, obviously, not to covet. And the first four words of this, it's actually just, just two words in the Hebrew. Hebrew is lo hamad, which is you shall not covet. Uh, but in the English, you shall not covet, the last five words of this command, anything that is your neighbor's. So really everything that we see between the first four words and the last five words is somewhat filler in this. Um, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. That's what it comes down to. Everything in between this is going into detail. Why does it do that? Well, here's the reason I believe, you know, because we can say, oh, well, I don't covet. Really? You really don't covet. Okay. Well, what about your neighbor's house? Well, he does have a nicer house than us. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, there you go. Um, so these things in the middle are telling us specifically things not to covet. Our neighbor's house, our neighbor's wife, which obviously that's lust, nor his male servant, nor his female servant. And you're thinking already, I don't live in a neighborhood where there's any servants, you know. <clears throat> nor his ox, nor his donkey. Well, let's put this maybe in a more modern context. We would say, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, you know, the one that jogs by your house every morning, your neighbor's employee, your neighbor's maid, nor his John Deere garden tractor with the bagger, mulcher, blade, and snowblower. <laughs> nor his pickup, not even if it's an F-150 Super Crew, <laughs> King Ranch Edition with the EcoBoost V8 in it. You can't, not, can't covet that. Here's what you have to remember, is if it's your neighbor's, it ain't yours. And then the question comes up from last week, who is your neighbor? It's anyone, right? It's anyone who is not you. That is your neighbor. You shall not any, covet anything that belongs to somebody else. If it belongs, if it doesn't belong to you, then it belongs to your neighbor. Well, you're saying, well, you know, no, it doesn't. It belongs to my friendly neighborhood Dodge dealer. Well, your neighbor. Um, you shall not covet anything that is not yours already. If it isn't yours, it isn't yours. And we'll see why as we get into this later. And you know, maybe you're thinking, "Wow, this sounds kind of harsh, Tom." Maybe you're taking this to an extreme. I don't. I don't think so. And we'll see why. But in our society, coveting is actually something that is encouraged. Um, it's just called the result of effective marketing, creating a sense of need for a product, 
even if you truly don't need it. That's what marketing does. It's called causing you to covet. Um, advertising is really successfully communicating that their product fits your needs. Well, at least whatever you think your needs are. You know, and they and 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 manufacturers have a really clever way and retailers of helping you to covet. You know, it's it's amazing what happens. You know, there's always that store that sends catalogs to your house, you know, um, the one that comes in the mail and you hurry up and get it and hide it so you hope your wife doesn't find it or else your one of your friends at work brings it to you because, you know, his wife wants him to get rid of it. She doesn't want it in the house because of all the problems it causes. And it's, you know, this one. Did you guys know Cabela's has a hardback catalog? <laughs> that doesn't come to my house. That comes from one of my guys at work. It's like, oh, thanks. Great. Now I have to throw it away. But I can't. It's a hardback. You don't throw away hardbacks. I can take that out. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe there's that store you drive by on your way to work every day and you see it and so you know every once in a while well actually once a week at least you stop in there and they're nice enough that they give you their catalog for free but it's that store your wife doesn't let you go to because you know of all the problems it'll cause northern tool <laughs> it's a good thing i don't work there i'd never have a paycheck I'm not advertising for them, honest. It, just, just giving you some examples here. But the idea here is that these things cause us to covet, you know. And, and a lot of times, if you're at the grocery store, you, you know, you walk by the magazine stand, and you'll find things there, and you'll be walking by, and go, oh, car and driver, look at that, the new Shelby Mustang, you know, the one I can't afford, and you know, would feel like an idiot driving anyway. Um, but there's car and driver, you know, so you get it. And, oh, I'm just kind of interested. Next thing you know, you're picking up brochures from the dealership. Um, better homes and gardens, you know, because everybody else has a better home and garden than you. And, you know, so you just, you want to make it better. And, and um, here's the one that really kills me. Um, every once in a while, you know, we, we get a lot of our magazines for free from the library. And the one that'll come home once in a while is something called Real Simple. Have you guys ever seen it? It's, it's like a home decorating magazine, and what they do, it's like they have this furniture that's basically a board with four basic legs on it. They paint it a color and then charge you 800 bucks for it. You know, it's like real simple. Wow. You know, so, I mean, that's, that's real simple. Um, but that's one of those. It's, it's, it's amazing, though, that they even make you covet simplicity. Oh, man, my life has gotten so complicated. I just want to get rid of all my stuff and get new stuff, simpler stuff. You know, and then... There's something in manufacturing that takes place that keeps companies in business. It's called planned obsolescence. You know, and you, you think about it, you know, how, how out of hand it gets. You know, I, I um, a number of years, well, a few years ago, we had a, our washing machine give out, our Kenmore, that we got when we were first married. It was 18 years old when it finally gave up the ghost. And I went into uh, an appliance store and said, I need... We need a new washer, and our, you know, our other one finally croaked after 18 years, and they said, we don't have anything in here that's going to last 18 years. You know, you can plan on about 10 or 11. That's okay, all right? So, you know, you end up spending a lot of money, three times as much as you did on the washer for something that lasts half as long now. Well, look at the refrigerator freezer, okay, when, you know, if you guys are about my age or younger, if you probably all had the same refrigerator I did when, when you were growing up, it was white. It had a freezer on top and a refrigerator on the bottom. And then, and then it started back in the 70s. Then they started putting an ice maker in them. And they came in avocado green and harvest gold. And everybody had to have one because those were the in colors. And then the next generation, they put cold water and an ice maker in the door. So you didn't even have to open it up. And, and now you could get it in almond. 
you know, and of course that almond really made your avocado green refrigerator look pretty shabby. Well, now you can get one that's uh, got Wi-Fi. It's a smart fridge. You can check your email while you're putting milk in your cereal. And they're stainless steel now. Um, you know, so it's like, wow, you know, I gotta, I gotta have one of those, you know, and now they, you get it and then the next year they change it just a little bit because now all the LED lights on it are blue instead of white. And you're going, oh man, I like the blue better. <laughs> there was a, one of my daughters was showing me this, this thing that she found like on YouTube where um, this guy went out into the street with an iPhone 4S and was having people, actually had two of them, he was going to people and saying, I've got, I've got an iPhone 4S and I've got the iPhone 5 and, you know, just want you to compare them. Here's the iPhone 5. Tell me what you think of it. And he found people that had iPhone 4S's and they said, wow, you know, it's really a lot lighter and it's a lot faster than my iPhone 4S. It was an iPhone 4S, you know, but this is, this is how people are automatically conditioned to think is that, you know, if, if Madison Avenue says I've got to have it because it's better then I've got to have it because it's better. You know, and this is what they thrive on, is making us feel like whatever we have is not good enough, and we either need to have better or we need to have more, one of the two. And that's how covetous starts. Now, here's where it begins scripturally as we look at it. First of all, it starts with the eyes. It enters in through the gate of the eye. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, you guys are familiar with the story where Adam and Eve are in the garden, and the Lord tells them that you can eat of any tree, the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil. And so, of course, you know, Satan goes to work on Eve, and then, you know, he tells her, and then finally he just basically out and out denies God's word to her. And we see in Genesis 3, 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. So it starts with seeing, and then you get this idea that this is pleasant to the eyes, so then you take it, you want it, I'm going to have it, and then you eat it, you consume it. And then what happens next is it, is it takes root in the heart. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to kind of run around scripture. I'll tell you guys when I want you to turn. Don't feel like you have to turn. We're going to go right now to Psalm 10, 3, verse 6. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. We're not going to be there that long. But in Psalm 10, starting with verse 3, it says, For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. So what, once covetousness then takes root in the heart, it, it leads to pride and a false sense of security. And it comes to fruition in the members of the body. Um, and where we see that is in Micah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. In other words, they're thinking about it because it's in their heart. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence also houses and seize them so they oppress a man and his house a man and his inheritance so as we look at this we see that um, the fruit of covetousness is a hunger for power um, it also can lead to theft uh, and to violence it causes the financial destruction of others and it brings about oppression now, uh, one I would like you to turn to is turn to Joshua chapter 7. Um, what I want to look at is a, is a case here in the scripture um, where somebody coveted and the results of it. 
We'll be in Joshua chapter 7, starting with verse 7. And this is dealing with the sin of Achan. So, well, here's what happens. First of all, Joshua is told to go take Ai. So what they do is they go and they spy it out. The spies come back and they say, you know, don't, don't send the whole company of Israel. Just send 3,000 men. And, you know, we don't want to wear all the troops out. So they go up against Ai and get turned in defeat and 36 men get killed. And so they're coming back. And, you know, and Joshua goes to the Lord because he's like, you know, what's happened here? And in verse 7 he says, And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? All that we'd been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back and is in, on, on before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel. There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come, by, uh, shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel." Now, the cursing, that's obviously talking about idolatry. He's this man, whoever he is, has taken an idol. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel before the tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. So can you imagine, here's Achan back here probably as he's, he's watching this going on. He's sitting there thinking, 12 tribes, what are the odds? I'm probably pretty safe. You know, there's only a 1 in 12 chance it's going to fall to my tribe. So the tribe of Judah is taken. So he's probably going, oh, Okay. Well, he brought the clan of Judah and he took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. So, as, as the Zarhites are taken, he's probably going, oh, oh, okay, well, this is getting a little close. Maybe it's still going to pass by. And then, oh, you know, Zabdi here is taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. So can you imagine, as it kind of gets closer and closer and closer, he's going, oh, no. You know, and by the time it catches him, I mean, he, know, he, he knows he's busted. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them, and I took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth, in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. So, Achan admits first that he coveted, and then he took. He saw with his eyes, he wanted it, and so he took it. And from God's point of view, when Achan took the spoil he was not supposed to take, um, according to verse 11, he actually took a cursed things, um, which means he compromised morally, he stole, and he deceived. See, coveting in the heart tends to manifest itself as moral compromise, conspiracy, theft, deception, and then even murder. You know, um, 
even if you take somebody who, who just like the rest of us, for the most part in here, I'd say we're probably law-abiding people. We really have no intention of bringing harm to anybody. But here's what can happen. And a lot of times if there's, you know, something that we just say, you know, my, my car died. I, I'm just tired of having a broken old piece of junk. I'm going to go buy a new car. Well, while I'm at it, I'm, I'm going to get a pickup because I really could use a pickup. You know, being practical about things, right? And, you know, we get a new one. We get, you know, five-year, 100,000-mile warranty on it. I mean, doesn't that make sense that we would do that? Well, so you don't have the money, so you agree that you're going to go ahead and make payments on it to the tune of $700 a month. And you know you don't have $700 in your budget. So you say, well, you know, if I just get a job, a second job, I can do this. You know, I, I know it means I'm going to have to, you know, miss church on Wednesday nights or whatever it is. And, you know, if my wife gets a job, we can pay for this and not even fill it. Well, it sounds reasonable. But here's what happens. Is in that time you're not at home, you're not spending time with your family. And in that time that you're not spending time with your family, they're spending time with somebody else. And in that time that you're not at home, you're also not in prayer or in the word. So when we work for the pursuit of possessions, it tends to bring about moral compromise. And when we compromise morally, then we reach a point to where we say, man, you know, there's easier ways to make a buck than this. And then, you know, we get tempted because there's easier ways. Stealing, dealing, or whatever it is. There can be any number of ways that we can justify so it's say, we can say, you know, I'll just I'll compromise for a little bit. I'll get this debt paid off and, and then I'll quit my job. It'll all be good. Of course, it never turns out that way. Now, I want to look at another example of covetousness. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 21. And actually, this is a place I'd hoped to go Sunday morning. We just didn't have time. But it just happens to fit in this section of Scripture as well. <clears throat> and this is the account of Naboth's vineyard. Starting in verse 1. And it came to pass... After these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house, and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. So basically, uh, well, but Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So basically, what's, what happens here is, you know, what seems like a very reasonable request on Ahab's part. He's saying, look, you know, I got this land, and I'd really like to have it close to my house. Don't really need it for a vineyard. Just want it for a vegetable garden. But it's handy. It's close to my house. And I'll trade you this one or one that's even better. Or if you prefer, I'll give you money for it. I mean, that all sounds really reasonable, right? And, and on the surface, Naboth, it sounds like he's just being stubborn because he says, the Lord forbid it that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers to you. I mean, you know, probably, you know, some of us are saying, well, you know, he's getting something better. Isn't that a better inheritance? Well, actually, it would seem Naboth knew the scripture. Because in Leviticus 25, 23, it says, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And then Numbers 36, 7 says, So the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe, for every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. So, Basically, what happened here, Naboth recognized that for him it would have been sin to sell it because it was his inheritance. This was something that was essentially sacred that uh, this land stay within his family. In verse 4, So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased, because the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face, and would not eat food. Uh, pout much? But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, 
Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. So basically Jezebel's coming to him and saying, Hey, what's the problem? Why are you so sad? Why are you pouting? And he says, Because I didn't get my way. I didn't get the vineyard I wanted. I wanted this vineyard and he won't give it to me. You know, and... and Jezebel, being the good wife that she is, says this. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You know, exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent them the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people. And seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So right now, Jezebel then is hatching this plan that involves conspiracy, theft, deception, and murder in order that Ahab can get his garden. Verse 11, So the men of his city, the elders... And nobles who were inhabitants of the city did as Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them, and they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with a high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. See, he was so focused on the possession of this vineyard that he couldn't even see the sin that was being done. So coveting has now given birth to sin. Verse 17, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. So, wow! You know, Elijah comes in, and he's swinging pretty hard on this one. Uh, he comes in, and he tells him, Look, you know, here's the judgment, and here's what's going to happen. The truth of the matter is, you cause death, and as a result... Uh, you did it for this piece of land, and your posterity is going to be cut off. It is the end of the line for you, Ahab. And he also talks about then uh, the death of Jezebel and how she would die. Okay, so now in the meantime, um, in Elijah's life, he ends up getting taken up to heaven in the chariot. But God hasn't forgotten flip to 2 Kings chapter 9. 
starting with verse 1. And Elisha, that would have been his successor, the prophet, Elijah's successor, and Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now when you arrive at the place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say thus, or and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not delay. So basically, here this, uh, this, this underling, this understudy, this uh, younger prophet is told to go in and, and find Jehu, anoint him, and then just get out of there as quick as he can. And then verse 6, um, Then he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, over, or king of the people, king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So this prophet did just what he was told. Um, so Jehu then goes out against Joram in war uh, at Ramoth Gilead. He's uh, the, uh, a son of Ahab. So skip down to verse 20 now. So the watchman reported saying he went back up to them, and it's... Uh, Verse 21, rather. Then Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out to meet Jehu, this is in battle, and met him on the property of Naboth, or Naboth the Jezreelite. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu, he, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? So he answered, What peace, as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? Then Joram turned around and fled and said to Ahaziah, Treachery, Ahaziah! Now Jehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow came out his heart, and he sank down in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, Pick him up. And throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember when you and I were riding together behind Ahab his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore take and throw him on the plot of ground according to the word of the Lord. But when Ahaziah king of Judah saw this, he fled by the road to Ben-Hagan. So Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also in the chariot. And they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is by Iblaim. Then he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king over Judah. Now when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. And it, you know, this is weird. Who gets made up when they're about to be killed? I just don't get this woman. Then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood spattered on the wall. And on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. So, you know, he stops from killing for a little lunch. Then he said, Go now, see to this accursed woman, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they came back and told him, and he said, 
This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by a servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field, in the plot at Jezreel, so that they shall not say, Here lies Jezebel. So Jehu ends up going to Jezreel, and Jezreel meets her demise, just as prophesied by the Lord. And to think, all this started because Ahab coveted something that belonged to his neighbor. Where does it end up? It ends up in the grave. When, it's, when covetous is not dealt with, it will lead to the grave. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted... I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire, that word can also mean lust, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So this is what the word's saying. Where it starts is a something that comes in through the eye and where it ends up is something that goes into the grave now you know we've seen we've looked at now the effects the outcome of covetousness where it can go where it can end up but here's why covetousness is wrong covetous is a very subtle sin with some very destructive results you know, we see it uh, and we look at the three forms of temptation that we all face. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All are forms of covetousness. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root which is covetousness, is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So from what Timothy's saying, these people started out in the faith, but they strayed from the faith because of greed, because of covetousness. So it's not just sin, you know, that's what other people do. This is a warning that this is something that can happen to any one of us. And in fact, I think if we were honest about it, we would probably all say that of these commands, it is the one in our life that we commit the most and we most easily tolerate. Look at my catalogs. You know, I mean, there it is, you know, and, and it's funny how these things work. I mean, I can just sit down and think, oh, yeah, just got a minute here. I'm just going to thumb through this catalog. Oh, toolbox, you know, like the one I've got in my garage isn't good enough, you know. Habakkuk, chapter two, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Um, is in this Bible somewhere. Uh, let's see. Honest, I had it tagged. Habakkuk chapter 2, starting with verse 6, says this. Will not all these take up a proverb against him, and a taunting riddle against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. In other words, takes a lot of debt. And to him who load, uh, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty. You know, we've just come through, in our country, one of the worst debt crises we've ever had. You know, where is this? Just this lending bonanza where anybody that could fog a mirror could borrow 110% of what they wanted to purchase a home for so they'd have some money left to put furniture in it. And many did. And then when the housing bubble burst and the economy started to tank and people started losing their jobs, well, what happened? Creditors rose up suddenly. And those that would oppress them awoke. And people's possessions were repossessed. It became booty. Verse 8, Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnants of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high 
that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. So basically sin, first of all, woe to him who increases what is not his, takes on a lot of debt because his creditors will rise up suddenly and they'll do whatever they have to collect their money and you will become their booty. In other words, because what does Proverbs tell us? That the borrower becomes slave to the lender. Coveting evil gains for one house is born out of a desire to trust ourselves for our deliverance rather than to trust in God to provide. And it affects our judgment. It does have a bearing on it. And then he says, your own house will testify you. You know, one of the things that, that you know, I, startled me with the, the housing bubble as it burst was to see the number of half million dollar homes being foreclosed on. Because usually if you lived in a half million dollar home, that said you probably made enough money to make the payments. And in fact, if you lived in a half million dollar home, you probably didn't have a mortgage because you had the money in the first place. But what happened is many people were seduced into thinking that they had to have a McMansion. And because property values were only going up, right? You know, isn't that what we all believed? And as a result, it affected people's judgments. And now with the number of half a million dollar houses that are sitting out there as foreclosures for sale, the bricks and the mortar, the timbers are testifying against the people who made those decisions. Covetousness is the incarnation of a lack of contentment. The commandment against coveting is a command to be content with whatever God has already given us. That's what the command is about. Coveting is our way of telling God that what he has given us is not good enough and we don't trust him to provide the things we need. So how do we avoid covetousness? Now, I'm not saying you avoid possessions. You avoid covetousness, what's in the heart. Well, Luke 12, 15. As Jesus is speaking, he says, Take heed and beware. And that's, that's good advice right there. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. James 4, 4. Uh, James 4 verses 1 through 4 says, uh, says this. It, it, it helps us recognize covetousness because it's a, our desire to spend it on our own pleasures. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You know, it's funny. It makes this reference to war and how it starts. If you look back to the Gulf War, what did it start with? Saddam Hussein coveting the oil fields of Kuwait. That's where it started. And where has it ended? It hasn't ended because we still have the war on terror. It's it's just turned to turmoil in the Middle East. Uh, it's It's been... Uh, resulted in one of the longest continuous military involvements and costliest military involvements we've ever seen, as have other countries as well. But then the third thing we can learn is don't be deceived by covetousness. James 1, 3, verses 13 through 16. Let no one, who, uh, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gets birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So James's advice is don't be deceived by covetousness. It has a way of deceiving us and thinking, you know, this is something really good. I mean, look at Eve. She looked at the fruit and she said, wow, it's desirable to make one wise. You know, hey, this looks good. What can be wrong with this? Philippians 3, 17 through 20 says, Brethren, join in, the fo in following my example and note those who so walk as you, ha as you have us for a pattern. 
For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have to understand that we cannot love God and serve our possessions. You know, possessions can be just a terrible master. Colossians 3.25, yeah, 3.2 through 5, how about, says um, this, Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So we're being told the way to deal with it is also to mortify our members to put our flesh to death. Finally, I want to look at Psalm 119, verses 36 and 37. And the psalmist writes, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. So we need to turn our eyes from looking at worthless things and seek God instead. You know, and that's, that's the thing. It's, it starts with the eyes. And that's where we need to start with it too, is getting our eyes off the worthless things and being able to look at things and say, you know, I don't really need this catalog around anymore. And, you know, and, and you know, I know people joke and say, I'll take it, you know, but um, <laughs> don't. <laughs> You're better off without it. But Ecclesiastes 5, 10, and 11, we learn from that that he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? See, so here's what really happens when you increase your goods. Guess what? You know, it's, I think of a story of uh, an old pastor of mine who uh, a number of years ago knew a farmer up in North Dakota, found oil on his land. This would have been years ago. And, you know, just became a millionaire overnight because of the oil. And, you know, and and our pastor asked him, he says, well, what's it like, you know, having all that money? And he says, well, you know, to tell you the truth, it's really not very much fun. He says, because what I found is all of a sudden I have new friends and I really don't know who my friends are anymore, even if I even have any friends. So with the increase of wealth... Increase those who eat them. So we just need to be content with what we have. Because the more we have, the more that gets consumed. You know, possessions can either be a good servant or a cruel master, but usually it's the latter. Usually it's the latter. You know, and I think at David's prayer, and I know I'm going to butcher it because this isn't in my notes, but basically he said, Lord, don't make me poor so that I profane your name, but don't make me rich so that I forget you. And, you know, and I think that should be the desires of all our heart. And how much is too much? When it takes our eyes off the Lord. You know, that's how much is too much. Then it's time to get rid of some. Make sure if you have possessions that you understand that you were just a steward. And we all have possessions of some kind. It all belongs to the Lord. And he can assign a new steward anytime he wants. He can do it through a courtroom, through a lawyer, or through a fire. He can, or through a thief. He can do it however he chooses to do it. Romans 13, 8 through 10 says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other command are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not do harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So love your neighbor and let that be the guide of your stewardship. You know, and that's... I love Jesus' summation. 
of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, when he was asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hangs all the law and the prophets. So, you know, as we finish up the Ten Commandments here, then, you know, we see that all are reflective of an inward attitude of a heart. And the, even the commandment to not do something is a commandment to have a proper attitude in a certain way. And in this case, the command in the 10th command is to be content with what God has given you. And when we're content with what God has given us, if he feels we need more or he wants us to be the stewards of more, he'll put that in our hands. But it's not so we can squander it on our own desires. He has purpose for it. Let's finish up this chapter. We'll just read through it because we covered it in depth so many weeks ago. We don't remember it. Uh, but starting in verse 18, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You shall speak with us, and we will hear you, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Remember, if we go back, they're still kind of freaking out on the mountain at what they're seeing here, and they're going, you know, God's too mighty for us. You talk to him. Um, we'll talk to you. You just tell us. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So as we look at this and we hear these commands now, and we understand what they are. God wants to reinforce to them that he is God and he's serious about keeping these commands. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of the earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. And the reason it's profaned is because God wants us to do things his way and not put our marks of ownership on it. Verse 26, nor shall you go up by the steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. So we finally, in about three months, <laughs> made it through chapter 20. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time looking into your commands, Lord. And in these commands, Lord, we, we see them not as the, the ten do's and the ten don'ts, Father, but just the things that you desire for us. The holiness, the things about your character, the things that you want us to show that we are set apart from the world, to live set apart from the world, not be defiled by the world. Father, we thank you that these are for our good. And Lord, above all, we pray that in all our interactions with other people that we remember your commands father to love you with all our heart soul mind and strength and to love our neighbors ourselves. father we bless your holy name in jesus name amen